Okay, let's pick up a new topic. At the heart of social cognition is social perception. What we're always trying to do when we encounter somebody or move into a social situation or engage in some kind of social behavior is to form an impression of what's going on. And that's what social perception really is all about. One thing we know about perception in general is that perception and categorization are uniquely, intimately um, associated with each other. Uh, Jerome Bruner uh, pointed out at one point that every act of perception entails an act of categorization because in the very process of perceiving something and identifying something, we identify something as similar to some things we already know about and different from other things that we already um, know about. So. Um, Inferring the categorical or categorical, that's the way I put it, that's his word, uh, identity of an object is as much a feature of perception as, uh, as anything else. Now, just as a little historical note here, Bruner was an early cognitive psychologist. Uh, he was way ahead, of, uh, the, uh, way ahead of the game in that respect. And before Bruner, there was, it was customary in psychology, there wasn't cognitive science yet, it was customary in psychology to make a distinction between so-called lower and higher mental processes. Lower mental processes were those that were very closely tied to the stimulus situation, like sensation and perception. Higher mental processes were those that somehow got away from the, the immediate stimulus, like memory and thinking and problem solving. And one of Bruner's earliest insights back in the 1940s was that that's a false distinction, okay? Because the very process of perceiving requires you to think about the objects that you're perceiving. That all of perception is not made of the sense stuff. It's not made of just what's in the stimulus, but when you perceive an object, you bring knowledge from, acquired through prior experience to bear on the, act, uh, on the act of perception. So what we want to do for the next couple of days is to talk about the categories that form the framework for social perception, and for that matter, for social, uh, for social memory. Um, in my lectures on social memory, I focused on episodic memory. This is a moment where we can turn our attention to social semantic memory, because our categorical knowledge is something that's a feature or uh, something that's a part of semantic memory. Semantic memory, you'll remember, is abstract. It's context-free. It's kind of like the mental dictionary or the, the mental encyclopedia. It doesn't hold your knowledge of specific events and experiences that have a unique location in time and place, but rather it's somewhat more, out, more, uh, more abstract than that. Uh, semantic memory holds our knowledge about objects in general, our knowledge about language, uh, and it holds our categorical knowledge, knowledge about subset and superset relationships, similarity relationships, uh, relationships between categories and attributes, and so on. Okay? Now, in the social domain, uh, what's important to understand is that categorization is an important cognitive basis for social behavior for the simple reason that if we identify two people as belonging to the same category, or we identify two situations as belonging to the same category, we're likely to behave in the same way in, with respect to those two people or in those two situations. So categories constitute equivalence classes. They are, the, the members of a category are more or less equivalent with respect to category membership, and they elicit from us more or less um, more or less equivalent forms of behavior. So that if you want to know why, how somebody's going to behave in some situation, you want to know how he or she is going to categorize that situation. We can expect people to behave relatively consistently across different situations that belong to the same category. But once we cross the categorical boundary, we can expect people to behave differently, that is, inconsistently. So categorization is the basis of perceptual similarity, but it's also the basis for behavioral uh, similarity. A couple more things here. Let's just do a little bit of cognitive psychological background for a second. Uh, we want, uh, there's a, sometimes a difficult distinction between a category and a concept. Uh, for my purposes, we're going to use these terms interchangeably. But there is a technical distinction between them, which is, uh, in some sense, category, uh, the categories are, in some sense, objective. Uh, they exist in the real world, outside the mind. And we can think about a concept as a mental representation of a category. That is, it's our image of what a category is like. So in the animal kingdom, there are birds, and there are fish, and there are mammals, and there are protozoas, and those things exist in the real world, and they're related to each other by a set of real-world cate uh, category relationships. Fish are cold-blooded vertebrates with fins and, um, and uh, scales. Birds are warm-blooded vertebrates with feathers and, uh, and, and, and wings. All fish have those, have those objects, uh, have those features. That's a category that's in the real world. But it turns out that when we represent our knowledge about categories, we sometimes don't use those kinds of features. Uh, and in fact, we often go beyond those defining features to represent categories in a way that's quite different than the way they exist in the real world. So the question for us for the next couple of days is first, oh yes, there's a further distinction between two kinds of categories, natural categories, which are part of the natural world, okay, and artificial categories, which tend to be contrived by people mostly for the purposes of studying categorization, right? Uh, so the first thing that we want to know is what, where, what's the relationship between the actual structure of the social world and the structure of the social world that we represent in our heads? Is that, do we discover the categories that exist in the social world, or do we somehow impose that category structure because we bring to our experience of the world, our perception of the world, a set of more or less pre-existing categories. And then the second question you might want to ask is just how natural are social categories? As you'll see in a couple of minutes, uh, some categories, some social categories look like they really are natural, they really do exist in the external, in the real world outside the mind, but others, not so much. They don't have all that kind of quality. Okay. Now, another uh, point that I, that I want to uh, come back to in the third of these, uh, of these lectures is that cognitive psychology and cognitive science have developed a set of models of conceptual structure uh, over the years. Those of you who have had Psych 1, especially if you've had it with me, know about this. Those of you who have had Cogsci 1 also uh, will, will know about this. That should be almost everybody uh, in the class. Um, but uh, there are these views about how concepts and categories are structured. See, there I go. I'm already using these terms interchangeably. Um, but the prevailing view in social cognition favors what's known as the prototype view, which is that categories are uh, fuzzy sets. There aren't sharp boundaries between uh, the categories. And rather than being summarized by a set of defining features that are characteristic of every single category member, like fish are cold-blooded vertebrates with uh, scales and fins, um, what we have is uh, what we mentally represent these categories in terms of a summary that focuses on characteristic uh, features, not necessarily the kinds of defining features that are characteristic of proper sets. There are other kinds of views, too, an exemplar view and a theory-based view, and you probably know all about that uh, already. I'll come back to it in the third lecture, where it's really uh, critical. But first, let's start talking about what social categories we have and how, what they look like. Let's look not at the process of categorization so much, or the structure of categories in the abstract so much, but what categories we have and what their content uh, looks like. 
In social psychology and social cognition, the first big category can be easily characterized as us versus them. Okay? We naturally divide ourselves into groups, and as far as social cognition is concerned, we naturally divide the world into people who are like us and people who are not like us. This is an old insight. It comes from um, a, a sociologist named uh, 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 Summer who characterized, uh, uh, who distinguished between what he called the we group, people like us, the group to which we, uh, we belong, and others groups, uh, which are all everybody who's outside that group. Uh, the next question, of course, is, well, who's we? Yeah. Uh, well, it turns out that who we is depends a lot on how we perceive the groups that we're part of and what groups happen to be present at the time. But what Saunders, uh, Saunders uh, the basic insight was, we always perceive ourselves as part of some group or other. And we perceive at least some other people as not in that group. That's a fundamental, uh, fundamental social distinction. In social psychology, the, uh, the fundamental distinction between us and them is uh, uh, vividly illustrated by a classic experiment known as the Robbers Cave Experiment, because it took place at Robbers Cave State Park in, uh, in Oklahoma. This is work by Muzaffar Sharif uh, and his colleagues, who surveyed Oklahoma City to find a group of fifth graders who were absolutely average in every conceivable respect. They were average in IQ, they were average in socioeconomic status, they were average in athletic ability, they were average in every dimension you can imagine a, fi a fifth grader can be, um, uh, can be uh, 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 measured on. Um, and uh, they, they found 22 of these kids, okay, uh, and recruited them to participate in a summer camp experience that went on for about 20 days. Uh, and what happened was uh, th these, these 22 kids were divided into two groups of 11 unbeknownst to them, and they were taken to separate campsites in, uh, in, in Robbers Cave uh, State Park and encouraged to bond with each other by going through all sorts of uh, various kinds of activities together, uh, playing games and uh, sharing wigwams or whatever it was that they, they, they uh, slept in uh, in the park and, uh, and all that business. And they were encouraged to kind of develop a group identity. Uh, one group uh, began to call itself the Eagles, and the other group came uh, to uh, call itself the Rattler, the, the Rattlers, the Rattlesnakes. And for the first week or so of the experiment, uh, they developed each of these groups uh, uh, developed a, a tremendous amount of cohesion and harmony and even a little hierarchical structure where there were leaders and, and, uh, and, and followers, each group completely ignorant of the other. Okay? In the second stage of the experiment, the two groups were brought together. They were saying, hey, you know, it turns out there's this other group of kids over on the other side of the park, and we're going to get together and we're going to have some contests and things like that. And what happened, of course, was that the Eagles and the Rattlers, instead of seeing themselves as perfectly average Oklahoma City kids who just happen to be in two groups, uh, they developed a tremendous amount of intergroup hostility and, uh, and uh, uh, the competitiveness and, uh, and, and all that business. Moreover, it turns out that as soon as the two groups were brought together, each group, the dynamics of each group changed so that there were changing patterns of leadership. So now, uh, as soon as the two groups were engaged in, in athletic contests, the better athletes, remember these kids were all average to begin with, but still some kids are better at baseball than others, uh, be be became leaders. Or when they were engaged in, uh, in more intellectual pursuits, the smarter kids, slightly kids were perceived as smarter, uh, be uh, became um, uh, perceived as leaders. So everything changed when the two groups came together, but basically the two groups began to perceive themselves as us and the other group as as uh, them. This actually had, here's an example of the signs that, uh, that, the, uh, um, uh, that, that the Rattlers uh, 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 came up with, they're scribbling the stuff on bed sheets and everything. At one point, um, there, was a, there was a contest in which Sharif and his colleagues scattered a whole bunch of beans on a playing field, and there was a contest between the Eagles and the Rattlers in terms of who could pick up the most beans over a specified period of time. This was a long time ago. You could actually engage fifth graders in a, con in a contest like this without having them call you all sorts of, uh, all sorts of names. And then what happened was the, uh, the, the judges said, well, we're going to count these beans, and we're going to find out who, who got the most. But uh, uh, the first, they, they uh, flashed uh, photographs, slides of the arrays of beans that each, uh, that each group had uh, collected and asked the kids to estimate how many beans were in each group. And the obvious result is that uh, eagles, when the eagles were the judges, the eagles thought that they had picked up more beans than the rattlers had. And when the rattlers were the judges, the rattlers thought that they had picked up more beans than the eagles uh, had. In fact, there were exactly the same number of beans in the, in the array, that they were, uh, array that they were viewing. The point here is that group membership even affected something as elementary as, uh, as perception. Now, just so you know that things turned out okay, in the end, in stage three, um, the, uh, the two groups that had developed this tremendous rivalry uh, were engaged in, uh, were, were kind of led to engage in cooperative behavior. The Sharif and his colleagues staged a number of emergencies that required the two groups to compete with each other. And uh, it turns out that these stage crises led the kids to cooperate. All of a sudden, they saw themselves as part of a larger whole, okay, which is kind of interesting. But the important thing is that these are just ordinary kids who are as identical to each other as you could possibly make kids in every way, but they still perceive themselves uh, in this us and them uh, in this us and them fashion. An even more uh, dramatic example of this comes from work by Henri Tajfel uh, and his colleagues known as the minimal group paradigm. Here, in, in, in the Sharif experiment, at least the kids had some basis for perceiving a we and a them. Actually, they had had a week of, uh, of uh, group cohesion producing activities. But in these Tajfel experiments, people were essentially arbitrarily assigned to uh, the membership of, uh, uh, in a group. In one case, uh, on the basis of their purported artistic preferences, the, the, uh, uh, the subjects were given a, uh, a test in which they were asked to, to choose which they preferred, paintings by uh, Clay or paintings by Kandinsky. Okay? And then they were told, oh, you're one of these people who prefers Clay's, uh, Clay's to Kandinsky's. And other people were told, oh, you're, you're one of the people who prefers uh, Kandinsky's to, uh, to Clay's. In another version of the experiment, people were simply assigned to one group or another, group X or group Y, by virtue of a toy, uh, coin toss. Okay? So completely arbitrary. Uh, the individuals were told what their group membership was, but they never encountered any other members of their group or the other group. So they didn't know the others in either group. They had no basis for de developing any kind of in-group or out-group stereotypes. There was, as opposed to the Robbers Cave experiment, there was absolutely no history of group uh, interaction. Yet at one point, um, the, uh, the investigators, uh, Tajfel and his colleagues, uh, asked group members, individuals, to distribute rewards between their group and the, uh, uh, and the other group, between members of X and members of Y, um, just on the basis of, of, of these points. So you give them a, 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 an allotment of points, you know, how many points do you want to keep for your group and how many points do you want to give to the other guys? And what happened was that people distributed more points to their own group than they did to the other group. This is just two separate experiments showing this basic effect. Again, it's called a minimal group paradigm because these people didn't even know each other. They had absolutely no contact. Yet, because they were clay preferring people, or Kandinsky preferring people, uh, or heads versus tails uh, the people, they tended to prefer their own group uh, to, uh, to the others. Uh, on the base of this, uh, Henry Tajfel and his colleagues developed what they called a
that is, um, that is made by any member of the in-group tends to filter out to other members of the in-group so that they bask in reflected glory. When the Cal basketball team wins, uh, the study's been done, people are more likely to wear California t-shirts and sweatshirts the next day uh, because somehow that, that, that achievement filters down uh, to the rest of, uh, of the student body. So again, there's a social identity uh, of the process that's going on. Moreover, it turns out that there is an interesting perceptual um, uh, uh, consequence of, uh, of, of, of group membership, uh, which is that people tend to perceive members of an in-group as more similar to each other and members of an outgroup as less similar uh, to, uh, to them. So here is some work by Vernon Allen, who's one of my colleagues at Wisconsin, very, uh, very nice study. Um, actually assigned people to groups based on their, uh, uh, on their ratings of paintings by uh, Paul Clay and Vasily Kandinsky. Um, actually, the assignment was random, but that's not what the subjects were told. Remember, the defining feature of a social psychologist is that he lies to his subjects. Okay? Um, that's how you know a social psychologist as opposed to any other kind of psychologist. And then these individuals were asked to simply to predict, uh, to, to respond to a bunch of attitude uh, questions, and then to predict the responses of other members of their group and the other group. And what uh, Allen and Wilder, uh, David Wilder, found was uh, what's now known as the outgroup homogeneity effect, which is that um, people tend to perceive members of an outgroup as more similar to each other and perceive members of an in-group as more similar uh, to, them, uh, to themselves. Here's an example of this difference from the self. These, again, we have two experiments. People perceive the in-group as more similar to themselves and the outgroup members as more dissimilar to themselves. So again, just simple group membership, even very arbitrary group membership, will have these effects both on non-social perception, like estimating the number of beans spilled out of a bag, and on social perception, estimating the uh, attitudes and other social characteristics of various group members. Okay. Now, mostly we are not randomly assigned to groups by virtue of a, of a, of a coin toss. Mostly we're not as assigned to groups by virtue of our preference for paintings by Paul Clay or Vasily Kandinsky, but there are natural social groupings that we, uh, that, that we are part of, and those are the basic categories for, uh, for social categorization. Next question is, what are these? Roger Brown, famous uh, social psychologist, thought about this problem quite a bit, and he argued that when it comes to the social domain, especially when it comes to persons, that there are certain categories that seem to him to be very natural categories. That is, the social world naturally divided itself up in, uh, in various ways, like in terms of sex, or kinship, or age, or again, you can get into more interesting uh, the social categories. It's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting idea. I, I think Brown was, uh, was really onto something here. But one of the interesting things about this is that as natural as many of these categories appear, it turns out, in the first place, many of these categories are very hard to define. Second, different groups, different cultures will define these categories differently. Okay? And third, that the categories themselves will change, uh, will change over time. Let's look at what must be, by any standard, the most natural, the most fundamental, the most biologically given of all social categorization, which is sex or gender. Okay? It just naturally seems to be the case that we divide the world into thems that male, thems that are female, and each of us is one or the other. That creates a kind of natural, biologically determined uh, outgroup um, and, and in-group. So your category membership is determined by your chromosomal sex and by your phenotypic sex and all of that. And what you've got here is a very interesting kind of intersection of categories because, you know, here's, here you've got natural categories determined by chromosomal sex and phenotypic sex, but there's also a kind of artificial division to them too. But for most of us, most of our is a, a, a social interaction don't depend so much on what sex we are. I mean, sharing notes and stuff like that doesn't happen. Friday nights, Saturday nights, maybe something interesting happens, right? And there's also uh, a kind of intersection of the biological and social here. But it turns out that even something as apparently simple as classifying people in terms of sex or gender turns out to be kind of complicated, okay? And Fausto Sterling, a biologist at Brown University, for example, has argued that, in fact, we've got roughly five different bi uh, categories of biological sex. There's a traditional male and female, and there are, in her view anyway, uh, three categories of what she calls intersex or pseudo-hermaphrodites. Uh, there are individuals out there who are genetically male, have XY chromosomal uh, heritage, but for a variety of reasons have um, female reproductive anatomy. And there are individuals who are genetically female, uh, but who have, uh, with, at least in some respects, male reproductive anatomy. And then there's apparently two people on Earth uh, who actually have undifferentiated gonadal tissue, uh, uh, where the, the, the gonads are, in some sense, half ovaries and, uh, and half testes. But uh, Fausto's, um, uh, Fausto Sterling's uh, the point here is that the division of the world into male and female isn't quite as neat and clean as you'd like it to be. And it turns out it's even trickier than that, because superimposed on biological sex, which is what Fausto Sterling is talking about, we have an issue of gender identity, which is whether you identify yourself as male, or as female, or as transgendered, okay? Transgendered individuals are biologically male, but identify themselves as female, biologically female, but identify themselves as male. So if you want to classify people with respect to sex and gender, you have to think about not just their chromosomal sex or their external and internal reproductive anatomy, but you have to think about how they think about themselves, how they identify themselves. And then it turns out that there's a whole host of gender categories that go beyond uh, identity. Uh, every culture that's been studied makes role distinctions between males and females. Every culture that's been studied has some kind of concept of masculinity that's different from the concept of femininity. Some people see themselves uh, adopt a masculine gen uh, gender role, even though they may identify themselves as female. Some people adopt a feminine gender role, even though they may identify themselves uh, as male. Then there are people who uh, embrace both masculine and feminine characteristics. In this culture, they're sometimes called androgynous individuals. And then there are people who just don't really embrace either masculinity or femininity, as those terms are defined uh, within their culture. So we've got four different types of gender role. And the point here is that whether you're male or not, biologically,